Steve has mentioned the sponsors who uh, we are very appreciative of. Without them, uh, these events couldn't happen. Um, we have uh, competitors from all over Australia. I think uh, every state covered, is it? Yep. Very close to every state. So welcome uh, all you interstaters. Um, but also there's an international flavour. Um, we have competitors obviously from Australia, but also New Zealand, Japan, Hong Kong, Chile, USA and Singapore. So a big round of applause for all of us. Hopefully I didn't miss any fun for you there. Um, weather forecast looks really good for the week, but don't believe your meteorology or we'll get you in trouble. Um, there's some big tides out there, uh, 1.6 metre tides at the super moon or whatever the moon is called this, this time around. Um, so my advice, just follow the local Southport Yacht Club guys around and you'll, you'll be right. <laughs> um, so best of luck, I uh, hope to catch up with a few of you over the next coming five days. And a uh, fantastic regatta. Thank you. Thank you for it all. Uh, now to a man that needs no introduction, however, a massive warm welcome to your designer of the Hans class boats, Chris Mitchell. is by a process or a design a practice called universal design. A universal design is pretty weird because it's not a much, in my case, there's not a much science involved in it. It's about considering the needs of everyone. And uh, so you start off with a basic platform. In our case, we've got a concave bottom and you can reef it. You can do a whole bunch of things with it. Two rudders, um, three start, got a ballast centre board. But you you, you, you come across these problems when you're considering the needs of different groups of people. And I struggled for maybe weeks or months to how can we make this compromise to suit everyone. So you get to a point where you just have to give up. And the best solution is to just lie down, go to sleep, and during the night when your mind is still, all of a sudden as if by magic, you wake up in the middle of the night and bingo, there's a solution. So you leap out of bed and fly off to the factory and put that thing in practice and say, wow, look at that. And when you've gone through this process and there's no group that you can imagine, like you get blind people, so they come into the factory and they run their hands out of this thing, vision impaired people, I mean, and they can feel it, they, this thing's beautiful, right? Because all the curves and shapes are there. But when you get to a point where the final little piece of the puzzle falls in place and you, you, can, you get a great feeling and I call it, it's sort of a manifestation of love and it's considered the needs of everyone and there's no one that can't possibly solve this part and I get the feeling that it's, it's actually reached the stage where that boat is actually alive itself. So I don't claim to actually design these things. I'm just a dude who's been very fortunate to be able to go to sleep and during the middle of the night um, the solution will come on how to proceed. So that, that, that's the art. I've got a book we're producing and it's the art of universal design sailboats and um, it'll outline the, the, all the design process and all of our boats and they'll all be on the website so we'll talk about that later that. Thank you.
Thank you, Chris. I understand you say you don't uh, believe you're the designer. Well, that might be the case, but you're the father of the design. All right? Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to all please put your hands together for the Gumbi and the local dancer. fishing season as saltwater people, uh, the, the seagull would, would always, always help us with our fishing. So the migration of mullet that would pass through would come through around the cold months as they start to get cold for around three or four months and obviously on return. But what they're doing the first time as they're coming through in the colder months, they come from right down at the bottom of Australia and they come up the east coast and head up north for warmer waters. So all the times, like all the different tribes, there's different signs for different tribes as those migrations of mullet pass through those areas. In this area, the seagull was one of those uh, telltale signs because they would call out to the people and warn them that the migrations are arriving. And each and every time they would come through, they'd call out so the people would go and grab the fishing gear to go, and go down by the shore and get ready. But also, there's other signs, so natural calendars as such. So in this area, uh, the yellow wattle, or the silver wattle, which is yellow in colour, would bloom. And that would tell our people it's, it's the migration of mullet season. And also another telltale sign is the hairy grubs. So when the hairy grubs usually walk, they go on their own path. But when the mullet are passing through, it's like they link one by one and travel in big, big lines together and they don't break. So they do this the whole time and once those uh, mullet go, then they break off again and start to walk in their, their own lines again. And sometimes if you see them, they're up to 10 metres long altogether. So this is a sign as well. 
So this one, uh, when the, we do the dance, we portray the seagull striking on the water and teaching our people how to hunt as well because they're the best at hunting on those schools of fish. Always to hunt in the centre and not on the outside because if you hunt on the outside, that's where the leader fish are. And if you scare the leader fish, they go out to the deep water for safety, the rest of the school would follow them. And then we would miss the catch and we may have to wait hours or another day for that next catch to come through. So this one, Dance of the Sea Eagle, Mary Gimper. <coughs> local language here of the Kumbamari people, they say Gwanda for dolphin. So this whole storyline, uh, uh, Bulwangan comes from my teacher's language from Stradbroke, uh, whose song and dances we are doing today. And basically, they tell the story of their neighbouring tribal people and that story passed along to them and they started to use the same method. So old man Gwanda, he was a Kumbamari man here. And he would train all those dingoes up in the local area to help him with hunting and gathering. Everyone knew who old man Wanda was because he had all this grey hair and a big white streak through the middle. So he, they, everyone knew who he was. But as he was getting older, he started to, in a way, as we say, retire when we get older. And he would just walk with those dingoes along the beach leisurely every day. After a while, the local uh, tribesmen, they, they hadn't seen him for many days in a row they started to get worried. Until one day they seen the local pot of dolphins passing through and there was a new dolphin they'd never seen before with them. And this was a grey dolphin with a white dorsal fin. And they knew that old man Gwanda must have passed away, maybe even drowned, so, and he went into his uh, animal form again. So as he did in, in uh, human form, he helped the people get food by training those dingoes up. So what he did, he would train all the dolphins out in the deep water, water to round up all the schools of fish and they would drive them into the shallow for the people. So the men, they would grab their spears and go down by the water's edge with the women and children. The men would slap their spears on the water's edge and the women and children would stomp their feet in the shallow and obviously sending vibrations through the water. Once the dolphins felt this, they knew what to do. And then they gather those schools of fish, drive them in and the women would have these nets called doral nets they would scoop them up and throw them back on the beach. And always after, we'd give a small percentage of the catch back to the dolphins to say thank you. So this one, Buwangan, or Gwanda, calling of the dolphin. was one of our ancestors who taught us how to dance. So back in the dream time, as, as we say, the dream time references before human form. So all the animals we say lived here first, 
and after they lived here for many tens of thousands of years, they slowly changed in the human form. So those uh, big, tall animals like the crane, the brolga, the jabiru, they taught all the people how to dance. So we pay our respects because we get to do uh, what we do today because of them. And if you watch them out, out in the wild, you always see them dancing as well, and they also dance to attract their mate. So when we do this dance, we portray the cranes waking up in the morning, flying out for a feeding ground. Once they spot the feeding ground, they all land together and be, begin to feed. But after they're full, they're really happy, so they begin to dance. So this one, Dance of the White Crane, Garrigan. song and send them back to the sky country, thank them for over, uh, looking over us as well and all the ancestors that watched over us, we thank them too. And we do this song today, this one is called Gurring Ning Nami. Gurring Ning Nami is a very special song, this one's been presented for many, many thousands of years. So this one comes from the Bunya Mountains, up, up about a two hour drive north of Brisbane and this is uh, where one of my descendants come from and this connects to me as well and my family. So this was done every three years, this song and dance, at the Bunya Festival. So it was the Feast of the Bunya Nut. So if you don't know what a Bunya Nut is, we have the Bunya Pines, which looks like the normal pine trim, but they've got lazy limbs, so they come down like this. And at the top, there's a big, uh, basically circular shape, similar to a basketball, and around that size. And this is made up of many segments of Bunya Nuts within. So each three years was the best time to pick these and all the men in that area would go and climb those trees. They would then go down by the fires and roast them. They would send word beforehand for tribes up to three, four hundred k's away from either way, either direction, to come in and join for the feast. So tribes would walk weeks just to get there. As they would arrive then they would share out all those bunya nuts with all the different families. They would do other ceremonies as well, like marriages, sometimes wars or disputes that weren't finished. They would finish it up there because when we would fight our people, the way is we never fight to kill, we fight to, to maim, and that's the end of the fight. So once the other person's hurt, that's, that's the end. And it's like we shake hands and walk away, we never speak of it again. So that's our, that's our method in the old days of, of how we would walk. Um, so things like that would happen. So on their way home, as they leave, this song was sung to all the many different tribes to thank them, but also fare them, farewell them on a safe journey home. So this one, Gurring Ning Nanami. And for goodbye, we say your way. Yo, Gurring Ning Nanami, Yanya Bami. Yanya Nami Nanoro. Yo, 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 Yanya Bimi. Yanya Bapani. Yanya Bumamari. Yeah, yeah. 
today and our awesome dancers here and um, welcome to the country. I hope you enjoy and I hope you have a safe stay on Kumba Mary Land as well. Thank you. Thank you, Don Alright, ladies and gentlemen, if I can bring back to the microphone our Commodore Glenn Burrell to officiate the opening of our ceremony. No. Hello again. Um, it is my honour, privilege and pleasure to now declare the International Hansa Class Asia Pacific Championships. Open. <laughs> <laughs> 